So, I suggest we start with our little session here on the on the um, how to catch an Asian unicorn. Um, maybe there'll be more people uh, joining us during our 45 minute session here. Um, anyway, it's 11:15 uh, Central European time, and I it's my big pleasure to welcome you to our session here at the Horasis Asia meeting. Uh, my name is Matthias Kamp. I'm the head of the um, Asia desk at Neue Zürcher Zeitung, uh, Swiss daily newspaper. And uh, during the next 45 minutes or so, as I said, we want to discuss um, the big question, how to catch an Asia unicorn. This, of course, involves questions. Um, how different are the unicorn scenes in Asia, within Asia? What impact does COVID-19 have on these developments? Who are the unicorns and how can business leaders leverage their technology? Uh, to answer these questions, it's my pleasure to introduce our very dis distinguished panel, which has expanded overnight from four panelists to five panelists. Um, I want to start with Bernard Moon. Bernard joins us from the uh, US West Coast. Um, he's co-founder and partner of Spark Labs, which is a network of accelerators and venture capital funds that has invested in over 290 companies. Is that correct, Bernard? And um, Yes, that's correct. Across six continents since 2013. With 11 accelerators in locations such, such as Seoul, Taipei, Sydney, Singapore, working with major research universities such as such as Arizona State University. The other half of Spark Labs is three traditional venture capital funds, such as Seed Fund focused on the US and a Series A fund focused on South Korea. So next is Nalin, Nalin Singh. Um, Nalin is a former CEO of a Fortune 500 company. There he is. He's an author of half a dozen books and now a leading authority on startup funding in the Asia Pacific region. So we will hear from him later. And then our panelist who joins us, joined, us, joined us last night is Zhang Ji Wu. He's a founder and chief executive officer. There he is, um, of Me Health Information Technology, a company which he told me was founded in 2013 and, uh, provides, um, services to um, emergency medical uh, issues, I think. You will tell us a bit about your company later. And then fourth is uh, Hidetoshi Uchiyama. He's CEO of Unary. There he is. He joins us from Tokyo. Um, he graduated from University of Michigan. He worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers, A.T. Kearney, and then established Unary Inc. in 2015. Unary is the largest location-based service platform in Japan. They provide location technology to major mobile application companies and store location data from those applications. And last but not least, there is Mikhail Treibisch. He's president of Omnigrade. He joins us from Moscow. Mikhail is founder and CEO of Omnigrade, a unique crowdsourcing platform that for companies and organizations with ambition, ambitious noble goals is a tool allowing to form an international group of supporters inspired by their vision and ready to help them on an ongoing basis. Mikael is also one of the prominent figures of the international receivables finance industry. Prior to founding Omnigrade, Mikael served as CEO of NFC, the first ever specialized factoring company in Russia. So let me start, as I said, very honored to lead this discussion this morning in Europe, um, evening in US West Coast and uh, afternoon in Asia. Um, a few words to you, um, distinguished audience. Um, you can just throw your questions at us at any moment you wish. Um, there's a chat function that you can type your questions in and just go ahead if you feel um, if you feel you have to um, interrupt, uh, you have to ask something to our panelists, just go ahead. Um, I'm very pleased to pass those questions on 
to our five panelists. So let me start with you, Bernard, the first question. Um, I mean, we're one year into COVID-19 now, into the corona crisis. Um, can you give us a very brief overview? How has COVID-19 affected um, activities in the startup scene, especially in Asia? I mean, we could imagine that the impact is quite severe. Um, well, on the contrary, it, it hasn't been that strong of a impact um, just because most of our activity is in Korea and Taiwan. And those countries have dealt, you know, with the pandemic very well, such as other countries in the region like Japan and Vietnam. So um, I, I'm sure if you read the reports, like South Korea is almost uh, business as usual. And same thing with Taiwan. Taiwan was even better, obviously, than South Korea because They shut the borders early in January. So um, actually, our accelerator, which is uh, Spark Labs Taipei, the leading accelerator uh, in Taiwan, in March, they actually had a 900-person uh, in-person demo day with zero concerns going in and zero concerns going out. And actually, just two weeks ago, uh, they had their fourth demo day with over a thousand attendees in person. So um, you could really get back to you know, business as usual almost, I think, throughout Asia. Obviously, Asia is leading as a region globally. Um, in terms of our startups that are affected, the ones that are really affected are actually uh, the ones that have core businesses and activity with the US. And of course, it depends on the vertical, so. And Hidetoshi, the situation in Japan, I mean, we've just seen and read figures are rising, COVID-19 figures rising again in Japan, and, and there's new regulations in place uh, uh, to stop the spread of the virus. Um, um, how, how do you see the situation on the ground there in Japan um, uh, when it comes to startup and and, and uh, All right, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Hidetoshi. Okay, regarding the Japanese situation, um, the, you know, Japan is the um, too mature comp country, so um, the population is decreasing at this moment. So um, uh, the, our domestic demand is very weak. That's why a lot of startups are focusing on inbound tourism. But uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, the, the national gate is closed. So a lot of the inbound tourism ventures, are uh, they, they stopped their operations. So we have a significant impact on the startup uh, industry. So before COVID-19, AI, IoT, and B2B subscriptions and uh, inbound tourism ventures are the small unicorn. We don't have many unicorns, but they are small unicorns. But after COVID-19, the, the, the setup for the, the new standard lifestyle arises. For example, working from home, so for such as the EC platform or video conference platform uh, arises. Or the, after eight years uh, of administration, new prime minister uh, started the new uh, administration. So they, the, the prime, new, new prime minister started the new ministry of digital, so that's why the, uh, the ventures such, such as uh, there's a transformation in retail and industrial sectors arises uh, as a new, uh, new small unicorns. That's what's happening in Japan. Can I just ask a follow-up question to that, um, Hidoshi? Um, um, where, where do you see trends um, going, trends of unicorn ventures When it comes to different regions of the world, like the US, EU, and some Asian countries, probably. Oh, that, that, that's the uh, question I wanted to ask for everyone else. So, mm -hmm. in Japan situation, the, our domestic, as I said, the domestic demand is very mm -hmm. weak. That, so, mm -hmm. that's why we had to focus on the inbound tourism. But in other countries, such as um, China or US, that, that must be a different situation. So what, what kind of the trend, mm. the unique um, trend? 
yeah, maybe we can go over to Jiwu. Um, hi, it's very early in the morning there. Uh, yeah. now. Um, what I what I like to know first of all from you is is can you just give a very brief introduction uh, to your company that you founded in 2013? Because it sounded very interesting to me, and then and then the 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 startup scene in China now, which um, has changed dramatically over the past few years. I remember when I left China in 2012, it just started to take off. I mean, of course, there was Alibaba, but um, I mean, it's a completely different picture eight, nine years later. Now, if we look at Shenzhen, Shanghai, and uh, Beijing, if you could just provide us with a brief overview, it would be great to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ji Wu, and uh, actually, um, my company started uh, at 2013, uh, but, but I prepared my idea at 2012. So that was the exact time you left China. So uh, I did experience the time after you left China and the growth very fast. Uh, most, I think, benefited from the economic growth. Um, we have a job, you know, uh, no matter who is over there, as the economy is growing, you can do good business. So my company, we started at a, a good example. My company started at 2013. Uh, we uh, started from only 200,000 arm US dollars, but we were sold. I sold my company in 2016. Uh, actually, I also to public to the listed company that was uh, 400 times. That means uh, we sold a 600 million dollars. So that is a good deal. Uh, actually, uh, most of the, I, of course, we have good technology in the same time, you know, uh, we benefit from the growth of the, uh, uh, economic. In the same time, one benefit I think China get from multinational company, because my personal experience, I was, uh, uh, only director for Kodak Health Group for 10 years. So many good company in China, they have very good leverage from overseas experience and knowledge. So, just some introduction. Thank you, Jiu. Over, over to you. How do you view the big picture, like startup, venture capital, um, unicorns, the next unicorns on the background of um, COVID-19, 2020, 2021? Uh, I believe there will be some good unicorn comes. Actually, there, there, there are two very big impacts from COVID-19. COVID-19 definitely is a disaster for human. In the same time, uh, because of the COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, they drive the digital technology very much. Just like today, we are, kind of, we are having a conference online. You know, before that, we should have together. Yeah. But be together is very important for social, you know, human. But in the same time, the company 19 did a job, the tech, digital technology. So in my industry, I'm in the healthcare industry, huge opportunity, uh, it, not, a, not only in China, but also in States, in Europe. If you, you have a look after the business in States, digital health is very hard in States. Uh, look back to China, I believe the government tried to invest a lot in digital health. So that is the trend. So in that case, uh, I believe there are many unicorns in the digital health, digital industry and digital health industry. Um, so uh, there are many opportunities. Yeah. It's cool. I get a very good feeling. Jiwu listening to you and Bernard listening to you. Um, I mean, um, uh, it, it feels quite optimistic. And, um, Nalin, over to you. Would you, would you share this? So actually what Bernard said is true in that particular world, and we're discussing unicorns here, they have the cash to go through this cycle, much like the stock market where people who have cash can wait out the dips and still come out strong. It's the small guys who get wiped out and then they don't have a chance to stand back on their feet. But take a step back, forget COVID, go back pre-COVID. In 2019, Asia had half the unicorns that it had versus 2018. We had already slowed down from 42 to 23, and uh, the number of deals had dropped by 36% to 75, and the amount raised had dropped from 70 billion to 21 billion. So even pre-COVID, the unicorns were not exactly having it great with the accident of WeWork, Lyft, et cetera, et cetera. There was some 
uh, circumspect outlook, even pre-COVID. Now, post-COVID, of course, people are looking for great deals. Small businesses get wiped out. Big ones get bigger. So the valuations go up. Look at the stock market. The big ones have got bigger. The poor and the small have got wiped out. Now, the question is, where are the next unicorns going to come from? Which was our, which is our topic. Yeah, tell us, Nalim. Typically, we've had unicorns, I'm speaking from an Asian perspective, things that solve mass problems, education, transport, gaming, fintech. Largely, largely the 130, 140 Asian unicorns are in that space. They haven't touched lives at the core as yet, which is food, clothing, shelter, and health. My sense is next wave of unicorns that we'll see from Asia will come from agri-tech and health tech. These are two sectors that I'm optimistic about. Very, very interesting. Uh, we have to dig a bit deeper into, into this uh, um, aspect a bit later. Mikael, uh, over to you. What is your, what is your assessment of the, of the uh, current situation? Uh, well, we are facing one new crisis. Uh, maybe the, the previous crisis were linked with some financial difficulties or so economical difficulties. Uh, the current crisis uh, uh, came because of new infection, coronavirus infection. But all crisis is a mixture of uh, threats and risks and opportunities. So I think that. Uh, We now have much more risks and much more opportunities. And maybe one of the important conclusions which I can uh, make for unicorns is that um, uh, in the future, in the near future, it uh, could be um, companies uh, which uh, will have good chance to become unicorns from very new industries. So not only from IT or biotech, But for instance, from tourist industry, because I think that it will be uh, dramatic changes in tourist industry. Today, uh, tourist industry is facing with very serious issues, but also it's a chance I have to develop virtual tourism, for instance. So I think that uh, it will be much more promising industries after this uh, coronavirus crisis than we had in the uh, past. So uh, even um, Companies uh, uh, which belong to, let's say, old-style industries, not very uh, modern industries, will become a chance to develop, to increase the uh, sales volumes, to increase the capitalization, so on. It's, I think it's it will be much more chances for development in post-COVID era for many companies if they survive today. If they survive today, so have we? Have we seen already um, globally? Have we seen already like a wave of a wave of uh, like startups dying? And and I mean, you are insiders. You have um, overview of figures and so on. Was there like a um, uprise, like the curve, curve going up? And and yeah, I mean, there's some. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Bernard. Go ahead. I, I think it depends on. Uh, Definitely the sectors. I mean, I could say there's, you know, companies that have pivoted well and there's some horror stories. I mean, you know, this isn't one of my portfolio companies, so I, I don't want to cite uh, specifics, but I know one company that last year they uh, hit 100 million in revenue. And because they were targeting basically corporate services in the US and all the corporate offices shut down, they literally went to zero by June. And then they shuttered. So they're on a path to, to become a unicorn. And because of the pandemic, they completely shut down. So you hear of, you know, certain startups within these sectors. And these aren't just obviously um, seed stage companies, but at the series C and D that were doing well. But then the pandemic just totally, you know, you know, wiped them out. So. Wow. Wow. 
Mikael, did you want to say something? Or that? Yes, uh, well, uh, it's my, my personal experience, maybe not uh, with startups. I, I'm, I live in uh, three minutes working distance from one of the main restaurant streets in Moscow. So uh, we, we, we have about 30 restaurants in the street. And I think that now it's possible, according to uh, existing law, to keep the restaurant open. Uh, but about 25% of all restaurants are closed, not because of restrictions, but because they became bankrupt. So, of course, not all companies uh, will be able to survive. But I think that one of the second conclusion I'd like to make here, I'd like to, uh, to mention here, that it will be new quality of risk management uh, after the uh, pandemic. And... Uh, Uh, also, my, my my business is crowdsourcing, and I think that crowdsourcing can help to um, find hidden risks and to develop the uh, prevention measures, how to prevent uh, new hidden risks. Because I believe that in the next few years, it uh, might be a new pandemic, maybe not because of coronavirus, because of other viruses. And uh, I think that the, the quality of risk management will be much higher. It, it will be not the level of uh, risk managers, but it will be the level of founders of the companies uh, to understand the risk and manage the risks. So those are lessons lessons being being learned from yeah, this Yeah, exactly. Program. Nalin, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, when you mention lessons being learned, a lot of the unicorn founders at the peak of the pandemic were dreading the clauses they had signed when they did not imagine what a pandemic could do. Clauses that they thought would never come true. And there was a scramble to get out of them. So a lot of the paper unicorns got sh shut and went on the side, which was uh, good news. But now, companies that are turning unicorn, they are taking a very good, hard look at whether they want to be in that club because of the clauses that come with it. So there is a rethink. There is a good shakeout over there. But, you know, the larger point I was making uh, earlier, the first wave of getting unicorns based on quick innovation, aggregation, uh, putting technology in, I think we are seeing the fag end of that. Now people have to try harder and go deeper into more traditional industries. So, for example, I said agri-tech. In agri-tech, most of the action happening even now is in the downstream stuff. People want to do aggregation, people want to do supply chain, people want to solve a f a farmers' pricing issues, etc. They're not yet going into growing stuff, right? After all, the farmers don't have the privilege like us of working from home. We would all die of hunger. So there is a good hard look going on uh, at the back end things. And we will see over the next six, eight, 10 years, companies emerge from that space, which are more traditional, uh, more grounded, and actually deliver stuff other than gaming, aggregation, and a small boost of technology, and you become a unicorn. I think that wave is at its uh, fag end. It's very interesting, Nalin, because everybody now within COVID is talking about e-learning and, and, and things like this, and, and video conference tools, and uh, so um, very, very interesting. Everybody who talks about e-learning has never sat in front of a computer for eight hours and gone through eight <laughs> classes. That's the children. They hate it. <laughs> E-learning has not gone forward 20 years. It has gone backwards 20 years. The ultimate customer hates it. Do what you like. I <laughs> mm. uh, see. Um, the topic that we want to dig a bit deeper into, um, you mentioned it before already, was the um, health healthcare um, Jiwu, which is um, especially interesting in China, I suppose, because um, um, The government investing a lot into the development of the healthcare um, sector, and so um, so are there are there real chances? Do you really see on the ground, like 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 when it comes to healthcare, um, big investments and 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 companies being founded? Uh, yeah, actually, um, uh, from my point of view, the next unicorn should be already formed. But I don't know which one is. You just make some judgment by your feeling, your, your knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's very uh, clear, definitely in the uh, in the industry. They should be in the area which the uh, in China situation. Essentially, I believe in Asia, most country 
Uh, one thing is very clear. If you want to invest in Unicorn, you look at the government trend, what they want to do. And uh, uh, in the same, for example, today in China, a uh, healthcare service provider, um, especially if you can provide us, uh, the, the service to all the people, is very important. Another thing is like big, big data, and especially artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, as we are talking, you know, there are so many people in rural area, in the remote area, they cannot get enough uh, healthcare service. So a lot of this kind of technology will come together. So um, because of the China government's strategy, because of the COVID-19 and because of the technology trend, uh, the next unicorn could come from this area. And in the same time, if you look at the area, we can tell some company, they already be a uh, pioneer, uh, for a couple of years already, they just have good opportunity now, get many investment, not only from government, because the government intention, many private investors comes, huge uh, investment. So, but uh, from my point of view, next unicorn, if you want to look, look at the investor, if they have some investor from overseas, this one could be growing really a unicorn. So this is my opinion. Interesting. Thank you. you um, I want to ask you a question, Bernard. Um, Jibu just mentioned um, you also have to look at what the government is doing and, and where, where they active in. Uh, would that go um, for, other, for other Asian countries as well, like as Taiwan, Singapore, uh, South Korea, or is that a special thing in mainland China? Um, I think that that is very stronger in China. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Bernard, would you agree? I mean, you have the overview of other Asian markets like South Korea, Taiwan, and so on. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I actually did miss the first part of your question. Yeah, uh, Dibu was mentioning, which I found very interesting, when you when you look at um, like the possible next unicorn or development in the startup scene, always keep an eye on things that governments are doing. Where are they active in? What do they support? And so on. Um, this is um, goes for mainland China. Would you say the same for, for other Asian countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, or any other countries? Um, I, I mean, I, I think that's a factor. It can't be a driving factor because obviously there's a lot of various forces in the market. I mean, mm -hmm. whether it's like a, a, a top-down sort of approach by a government, or it could be sort of, you know, a lesser market-driven approach, let's say in South Korea, I, I think there's different ways that you, unicorns could develop and be successful, right? So there, you know, there's obviously a lot of factors that come in, come into play for a strong startup ecosystem, right? It's not just Uh, government policies and regulation and also guidance, right? But it's really how developed is the venture capital ecosystem? How strong is the talent base, especially the engineering talent base? And you could even extend to general management. Uh, then it also goes into how active the corporates are. And then also in terms of um, exits, right? You know, what type of companies within that country or region are looking to acquire startups from that specific ecosystem. So, so there's a lot of uh, different factors that we, we look at. So. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, uh, talking yeah, about uh, the Japanese situation, uh, it's, a, it's a bit different from other Asian countries. Um, so J Japan is a mature economy, so meaning that the 30% of Japanese populations are more than 65, 65 years old. And 40%, more than 40% of the Japanese government budget is about healthcare. So it's a critical situation. So, so, but on the contrary, there are very few startups focusing on, focusing on the healthcare. That's what I'm understanding. So I think, um, I, I think it's a bit, um, it's a very difficult problem in Japan situation. Interesting, because we would expect like, um, You made the point just now. I mean, the aging aging population in Japan. I mean, there's no country in the world where it's that severe, and um, so we would expect that there would be a lot of activity in that sector, like healthcare, yeah. um, um, elderly care, and so on. 
Yes, I think there, so. Yeah. There, there is a de- possibly a demographic reason for that. Most startups, most, not all, most startups are started by young people leveraging technology. They don't think of the old people as customers of technology. <laughs> That's right. You're right. Yeah. Well, and there's, well, 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 oh, okay, please go ahead. But, uh, ah, all right. Um, the, uh, um, the other side is that um, the, the Japanese, Japanese economy is, is dominated by large corporations. That's the other um, reason uh, yeah. that, that a lot of startups don't focus on, on focusing on the healthcare. Yeah, I, I would say South, at least South Korea, it's different because uh, that market is trending like the U.S. Because in the U.S., the average age of the first-time entrepreneur is 40, 41. Right. So while the mid twenties get all the press, the the real typical entrepreneur in the U.S. is usually actually in their mid forties to fifties, and that's what we've actually seen even in South Korea now, where first time entrepreneurs that apply even to our accelerator in Korea, we have a lot of teams that uh, Korea is I think trending closer to forty now for first time entrepreneurs. So you get a lot of these execs from Samsung and LG that hit you know. 45 and 50, and they want to go out and, and do their own thing. And most of these own things are actually solving very hard problems more than the typical consumer app that a 20 something does. So a lot of these startups that apply uh, by these middle aged uh, first time entrepreneurs, they're actually in healthcare. They're in like wireless tech, they're in, you know, autonomous driving, uh, AI, you know, they're in very sort of harder, deeper tech, you know, areas. Interesting. Thank you. Um, one word to our audience. Um, I would encourage you to ask questions at any time. As I said before, um, you can type the questions into that chat function. Um, if you want, to, I see there's still like uh, uh, 13, 14 people um, in the audience. So feel free, just go ahead and I will pass the questions on to our panelists. Um, one more broad topic I want to touch upon as long as there's no questions coming in from the audience is like, um, I always very carefully look at different locations in Asia. Um, I went to think about a lot and, and stories about these startups seen there. And then uh, it's Taipei, which is a hot place. And then it's Seoul. So if we compare these Let's just for a moment forget about mainland China. I mean, we will discuss mainland China later again. It's very important. But just these three, Seoul, Taipei, Singapore, um, would it be possible to outline like key differences between those three locations? Whoever wants to, go ahead. Hidetoshi, Bernard, uh, Jiwoo, I don't know, Nalin, Mikhail. The three, the, the, the first thing I would just make a comment, that while the three... Uh, geographies you mentioned they have what bernard mentioned right the engineering skill and the general management ba- uh, skills which is so essential uh, with a richer population that's willing to make angel investments etc what they lack with the exception of taipei is a large enough market where will you sell if you need to sell if you take the five most populous nations of the world then you're looking at China, India, Indonesia, America, and countries like that. So they, they always have to find solutions that can scale beyond their geographies. And that is the number one challenge, unless it's a very high-end uh, mass product in their own limited way. But generally, they need to step out of the geographies for a market. Um, well, actually, the data shows differently. It's actually not Taiwan, South Korea is larger. Taiwan's only a country of 22 million. And since the late 90s, Korea, South Korea has produced uh, tech unicorns, right? For a country of 50, 50 million, it's, you know, even on a recent chart by CD Insights, uh, Korea is number six in the world with 10 current unicorns, you know, such as Coupon, which is an e-commerce company that uh, got 3 billion from SoftBank over the past three years. Um, so Korea, I would say out of the three is the leading ecosystem, um, cause it's a, I would call it a tweener market, right? It's sort of like France. It's a small country of 50 million, but it's able to produce these billion dollar exits, uh, in the tech space. 
Um, and even our own internal study, we, we do the top three ecosystems that Spark Lab sees in Asia is actually uh, Beijing, Seoul, and Shanghai, right? And then there's a, uh, there's a gap between the other markets. Singapore, there's a lot of early stage activity because especially the government has supported a lot of these accelerators and seed funds. But only until recently, the past, I would say three or four years, there's been proper seed funds, right? But then, you know, historically, there still hasn't been that many historical exits within the Singapore market and even Taiwan. Um, so I would say that's the difference between the, the, the those three, at least in, in general. So Bernard, uh, the South Korea, is it because of the higher uh, per capita income that even with a small population, we are able to get those kind of uh, revenues and valuations? Yeah, I mean, you can could, you could look at the numbers, even like G market, like 10 years ago, eBay bought them for like 1.3 million, right? Because since the, the 90s, Korea has been in that, for a small market, it's been either fourth to seventh largest e-commerce market in the world, right? And even total revenue, which is sort of embarrassing because I think it's a bad reflection on its society. I think it's fourth largest luxury goods market in the world, yeah. right? It's like number one you know, for a lot of stores, for a lot of luxury brands like Fendi, like globally, total revenue, right? Even things like Mercedes, E-Class, number one total revenue seller in the world is South Korea. So that sort of, it shows that it's uh, obviously has a, a large population with disposable income, but also maybe focuses on the wrong things. So. <laughs> um, I have a question from the audience here. There's um, Christian Schmitz. Uh, he's CMO of Rice Exchange, and he just joined um, our discussion. Um, very interesting, a bit provocative question is um, um, you would like to know if there's any outlook to really disruptive unicorns in Asia, or are they mainly copycats from the U.S.? Whoever feels I, wants to I, answer. You know, that that is a popular misconception. Uh If you look at all the unicorns that have come out, whether in uh, gaming, uh, transport, edutech, etc., you may say the spark of the idea came from somewhere else. But the Asian unicorns that set, set those up, they have really catered to the local consumer. They have really uh, innovated to a point where sometimes they look better than the ones that were so, the so-called original. And yes, there are a lot of original unicorns out here because our problems are unique. The problems we have over here are not the ones that are there in Europe and America. So unicorns that become unicorns in these geographies, especially the poorer countries, India, Indonesia, to some extent, I would say China, though they are way ahead, uh, they work that much harder to get there in terms of the solutioning because the population is so diverse, the demographies are so diverse, they work that much harder. So yes, popular culture, that's a nice thing to talk about and laugh at in a party, but I wouldn't give it much credence. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, if you look at even a media example like TikTok, right, that's been innovating actually in the social space and it came, you know, all the innovation came from China. Um, and then if you look, even since the 90s, like the first MMORPG game in the world was from Nexon which is a South Korean gaming company with like a $28 billion market cap, right? They started that trend to even mobile game distribution. It was started by Kakao, which is a mobile messenger in South Korea that WeChat invested $60 million into and then took that same sort of formula and also started doing gaming and content distribution. Um, so there's been... Uh, a fair amount of innovation, I would say, that comes out of Asia. And even, uh, uh, you know, the famous U.S. venture capitalist, Bill Gurley at Benchmark, he says he actually visits Korea to see what trends occur, uh, what will occur in the U.S. five years later, right? So before, I, I, I would say, as an ignorant sort of Korean-American, when I visited Korea, um, like in the 2000s, I actually thought some things were just because it was Asian, I didn't realize it was because technology is so ubiquitous in South Korea, right? Because it, it's since the 90s, it, had, it, it has had the 
highest broadband penetration and wireless penetration. Because technology is so ubiquitous, that's why all this sort of fast early adoption has occurred and sort of new innovations have come out of a market such as that or even in China and elsewhere in Asia. So um, things that I used to think were culturally Asian, it's more now I realize that it's because technology is more ubiquitous in these markets. Wow, interesting. So, um, I mean, but I just mentioned uh, China, Jiwu. I want to bring you in again. Um, what are the trends when it comes to looking for to finding the next unicorn in China? I'm also thinking about locations like Jungan Tun uh, in Beijing, um, Shenzhen. Uh, what do we have to look at, look at and what can we expect uh, for the next three, three to five years? Jiwu, please. So, um um i don't have too strong uh, uh region expectations they are very you know um but uh, uh mostly um because of we are talking about the unicorn mostly come from new technology so you should go to some place they have much more uh talents who is good at new technology uh and uh, in the same time should go to some place they have more uh entrepreneurship They actually take a, take a risk. So when I look around, I think Shanghai, Pudong could be a good place. Shenzhen, definitely they have much more, um, young talents, very brave. They want to take a risk. And as well as Zhongguan Chun, because they have so many, you know, all the best universities is in Zhongguan Chun. So they have very good, uh, talents. So Zhongguan Chun, Pudong and uh, Shenzhen as well. Hangzhou could be the next one. Alibaba is over there. But not, go ahead. But not. Yeah, I just want to say a side comment too, not just about startups, but, um, you know, one thing, even with uh, world-class engineering in Japan. So my wife was on the early Android team, right, when Android was like four, five percent market share, and then she saw it grow to 80 percent globally. And she was the one that signed up 80 percent of the OEMs globally like she did all the asia deals so we would get all these free phones from all throughout asia to test out and we would get so many actually handsets from japan and i was like these are so cool why don't they like market it globally but the problem is is that japan is big enough with 100 million people that these kaios uh you know these like uh phones from like sharp or whomever yeah, they didn't right. care about mm -hmm. exporting it out so you do see a lot of cool innovations that occur within a market, but sometimes, you know, even large corporates or even startups that are in a large enough market, let's say even like China, I'm sure there's a lot of innovations that we don't see within China. Uh, I mean, that go outside of China or Japan, but they are just comfortable in that market. So that that's yeah, also a problem right. too. Yeah, I think so. I completely, completely agree with you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's because the, 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 the elderly, elderly the, at the center of the decision-making process, But thanks to the COVID-19, a lot of elderly people had to resign because they cannot go cope with the digitalization. So that's one aspect of the COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, time is almost up, but one question that is on my mind um, is, is um, because um, somebody, I think, but it was you mentioned uh, TikTok, um, uh, which was the, which is the big innovation that came out of China and it tries to venture into other markets. And, and um, I'm always trying to think of the next ones, the next TikTok and, and, and which uh, from, from, from China, the next innovation that will have a, that will um, arise to have a global market and, and um, the next TikTok. Jibu, any feelings about that or, or any estimate? Would you dare to say like, okay, that could um, it's very hard to judge. Every step time you can only tell which area, which uh, you know, industry, but uh, you never can hardly tell who is the first one come to be Unicom. So uh, we hope we cross finger from the right one. <laughs> uh, I would only add that whoever it is, I hope it creates more jobs and adds real economic value and not something up that's up there in the cloud with a paper valuation. Very nicely said, Nalin. I think this is a very nice, very good 
last sentence and a summary for our session that is very important, I think. Um, yeah, I think it was a very interesting discussion. I got a lot of food for thought now and, and maybe ideas for the next stories that I can do. Um, I want to thank you, um, Jihu, Hidetoshi, Mikael, Bernard and Nalin and um, very big thank you to you, the audience. Um, um, I think we had a very, very fruitful discussion and, and that gave us ideas for our next, um, next things that we want to do. Um, everybody have a nice day, have a nice evening, a nice afternoon and um, I'm saying bye-bye now. Till next time. Ciao. Great. Ciao. Thank you.